What's up, everybody? It's your boy True Element 78 in the building with the reigning, defending Mondo Lucha Hall of Famer Xavier Mustafa and the natural Crystal Black. And today is December 22nd, 2018, and you're tuned in to Saturday Night Slamcasters. And on today's episode, we're going to discuss Ring of Honor's final battle that took place a couple of weeks ago. We're going to discuss TLC as well as the shakeup that happened on Monday Night Raw and SmackDown this week. We're also going to include spoilers for next week's episode, which are airing on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. And like I said, we're going to touch on the shakeup and give you our thoughts on it and Vince McMahon and the McMahon's taking over SmackDown and Raw moving forward. We're also going to discuss a couple movies that came out recently. I'm going to give you my thoughts on Creed and Spider-Man. And as a group, we're going to give you our thoughts on the recent Aquaman release. Another thing we're going to touch on is I don't know how many of you guys out there have seen the guy who attempted the 450 splash to the outside and cracked his skull open. But we're going to discuss that and just some of the crazy things that people are doing in the industry currently to get themselves over, as well as allow Xavier Mustafa and Chris Black to discuss some of the most reckless things they've ever witnessed in person or had to talk someone out of. But to kick things off, the first thing we're going to do is our church announcements, letting you guys know what is going on with the host of the show over the next several weeks leading into 2019. Coming up just in a couple days, New Year's Eve, Legacy Pro Wrestling will be returning to Tanner Paul Hall for the NYE Fight Night. In the main event, you will have David Soul defending his Legacy Pro Wrestling Heavyweight Championship against the one and only Rough Crossing. And you have Angel Armani taking on our senior referee, Jesse Bush, in a blood feud that's going to end in a lumberjack match. So make sure you guys are there. The show starts at... Seven o'clock tickets are only ten dollars because it's our fan appreciation night. Yeah, I don't really have much to add. I know I will be also in attendance for that show. So I gotta talk to my booker. I'm not sure what I'm doing. I might be on punishment. I just want to say that Chris Black has made that promise before he was gonna be on the show and he didn't show up last time. That did result in him losing the tag team championship. Uh, titles of Legacy Pro because he was not there to defend it with TC. TC had to reach out to Doc Simmons, a newcomer in Legacy Pro, who had to step in in his place, and that may be why they lost it. So, you know, you're going to have some explaining to do to TC Washington at the show, but, you know, you have to, you have to be there to find out, fans. <laughs> and True Element 78 will also be in attendance at that show. I'll be DJing that night, and we're also going to be running a um, giveaway of two tickets to the next Leg Legacy Pro show that's occurring in February at that show. You'll win it by playing Superstar Bingo. We're going to play, um, it's going to be five to six minutes of bingo where we're going to play various Superstars theme songs. We're not going to tell you who the Superstars are or what the name of the songs are. You just have to know who the Superstars are. And if you get bingo, then you win the two tickets. So come on out. It's going to be a great show. Like Xavier Mustafa said, it's going down on December 31st, which is Monday of um, this upcoming week. So hope to see you guys all there in attendance. Another thing that I want to bring up right now is that be sure to check our social medias out. We're going to be posting a poll on there for different categories um, involving wrestling this year. Unlike a lot of other podcasts and a lot of other shows that you may watch or listen to, we're really only going to post matches or shows that we actually witnessed ourselves. So we're not going to post matches from promotions just because other people said that those were great matches. It will only be things that we witnessed. So if there's things missing from our list, you can hold it against us, but you can't say that we're pandering. So we're just letting you guys know we're going to keep it all the way 100 with you guys, but be sure to vote in our polls and let us know what you think out of our selections are. And we'll be discussing our own opinions on our January 5th show in 2019. Now to kick things off, like I said, we're going to discuss the WWE shakeup as well as the TLC pay-per-view. But the first thing I want to touch on is a pay-per-view that happened the Friday before TLC. And that was Ring of Honor's final battle 2018. The last show for Cody Rhodes as well as the Young Bucks. And um, yeah, we're just going to touch on our thoughts on that pay-per-view. I, I, me and Xavier Mustafa watched it together. And I know Chris Black watched some of the show himself. So... I'll let Xavier Mustafa kick it off and give his thoughts on the pay-per-view. 
Uh, I thought from top to bottom it was a good show. Um, I like the opening with Kenny King and Eli Osom, or however you say it, Eli Osom. Um, I thought that was kind of a, I don't know, felt like a cool impromptu match. Um, Christopher Daniels and Marty Scroll was it, it was what it was, and I like Christopher Daniels, but I think Christopher Daniels is kind of oh, how do I say this nicely? I think he's not going to be wrestling too much longer. I think the the writing's on the wall for him. Um, I was impressed by the Jeff Cobb and Hangman Page match. Jeff Cobb's has the most interesting power slam I think I've ever seen in my life. Um, I'm probably going to steal that and put that in my weapon draw. Um, didn't care for the women's match too much. The ladder war was exactly what we thought it was going to be. It was going to be a ladder war. Bully Ray and Flip Gordon was pretty entertaining. Bully Ray, hands down, I think he is probably one of the most underrated talents in any wrestling promotion. Like, he knows exactly what to do to get that crowd riled up, to get people to hate him and love whoever he's wrestling. That man is phenomenal at that. Um, the jo- Jonathan Grissom and Zack Sabre Jr., that kind of, it was a little short for me, but I think it ended the way it should, you know, like with Zack Sabre Jr. being the wrestling technician that he is and just out-wrestling Jonathan Grissom. Um, I thought that was pretty good. Dalton Castle and Matt Taven, again, Dalton Castle, phenomenal wrestler, phenomenal gimmick. Um, Matt Taven, I think, is at the top of his game. Uh, great match. Lethal and Cody. Um, I thought it was a good match. I don't think it was the best I've seen from Cody Rhodes. Um, so I don't know if just because they, they were wrapping up um, their time in the Ring of Honor, but I thought it was a so it was a good match. I thought it was going to be great, but it was to me it was good. And Jay Lethal is always to me a phenomenal performer. But I just thought I don't know. I don't know. If Cody Rhodes this was having a slightly off day, but it hasn't been what he was has wasn't what he's been producing as of late. So, so those are my thoughts on uh, Final Battle. Chris Black, you got any thoughts? Okay, so this one's kind of a treat for me because although. Ring of Honor is something that I'll, I'll catch every now and then with matches. I'll hear like a match here or there that I'll watch. I've never really watched a pay-per-view from start to finish. And although I did not completely watch it from start to finish because I had to skip through a, a, a couple little bits and pieces of it. But for the most part, I did see a lot of it. And I liked, I'd say, 90% of everything that I saw. Uh, the Kenny King match was very impressive. I think uh, Kenny King kind of said it in the beginning that this is basically a commercial for the school. Because of Eli Isom, I think this, this, I don't know if he's a kid or whatever, but he's pretty young in the business. Um, I think he's got good things going. Um, very impressive. Uh, Kenny King, he wins and he keeps the heat, which is something that a lot of wrestling storytelling is kind of dead. Like Kenny King, he still, he, he remained keeping his heat. He tried to fake the handshake or whatever, but it's just little things that heels do that I like. The Jeff Cobb Hagman Page match was very impressive. Um, this match was kind of to me shades of Samoa Joe Roderick Strong from the Ted Petty. I think it's 2008. I think me and Mustafa used to kind of go over that DVD series all the time. And it's, I'm going to bring that. I'm going to bring up that DVD series up twice in this. But that that match was absolutely amazing. The women's match I couldn't really get into. It was okay. I think it picked up when it got down to the last two um, competitors. Uh, I'm going to skip the Zack Sabre Jr. match just because I'm going to mention that last. The Matt Taven match versus Dalton Castle was a very good match. The first thing that I thought of was um, this Matt Taven is, I think, what WWE was going for with with Baron Corbin, but they couldn't quite get it. His character is, is, I think, everything that Baron Corbin was supposed to be, but isn't. Um, so maybe they need to think about bringing this guy in. Um, I had a holy shit moment when Taron took that bump on the on the um, the guardrail. Did you see that when he dove over the top rope and landed chest first? And I'm just sitting there thinking, how is this entire chest not broken? But I thought he died. Yeah, I thought he was dead after that. The Christopher Daniels match was a very good old school 
match that I really did enjoy. I think it ended perfectly. Uh, Christopher Daniels tapped out, kind of, um, you know, pass. I don't want to say passing the torch, but kind of like in that light, he kind of like, you know, submitted. He, he went out the way he's supposed to. He had the Bully Ray interruption, which was a, then he, which led into the match with Flip Gordon, which was a really good match. Jay Lethal and Cody, good match, like Mustafa said, not quite what I was expecting in terms of, um, I thought it'd be a little bit more, but it was still a good match. Okay, so I saved the Jonathan Gresham and Zack Sabre Jr. match last because this was my favorite match on the on the card just because I'm really into that style of wrestling. They mentioned before the match that this is the kind of style that kind of made Ring of Honor a name was this style that they did. And again, I remember going back to the Ted Petty 2008 where you had the who's who of wrestling. You had Daniel Bryan. You had Austin Aries. You had CM Punk. You had Samoa Joe. You had all of these guys. and They had this style of wrestling where you had the move for move, hold for hold, very competitive. I think that this match told a really good story. That Jonathan Grisham is, what, five foot four? This guy is tiny. And Zack Sabre Jr. did a really good job being the heel. He was very, very disrespectful of Grisham the entire match. It was a strike. They struck hard when they were supposed to. They did the holes when they were supposed to. It was a very, very good match. Again, it was my favorite match because that's the type of wrestling that I enjoy. And I think there's a, there's a place for it. But overall, again, can't say enough positive things. I kind of think I went on a tangent there, but... <laughs> you know, now that I'm thinking about it, I don't even remember Zach Sabre Jr. actually being a heel in that. I thought it was baby, baby, but it probably it probably was. But yeah, I will say, there's there's a few, only... I don't want to say a handful of wrestlers, but there's not that many wrestlers that can wrestle that style. And I think that style is, is phenomenal because it takes a lot of... It takes a lot of patience. It takes a lot of timing. It's so, and I have used the word technical to describe technical wrestler, but it is so technical, it's ridiculous. Yeah, um, this was my first time ever watching a Ring of Honor pay-per-view all the way through. Um, and I thought that it was really good. I'll just give you a couple of the highlights to me. I really enjoyed the Jeff Cobb and Hangman Page match. I thought that that match was just everything that it should have been it was a it was basically power versus um te technical ability um jeff cobb just basically showing off he's kind of like he's kind of like ring of honor's version of Taz, in my opinion because he's just in there throwing all types of suplexes and throws at hangman page so i really enjoyed that match the marty scroll match was was what it was it was a it was a decent match um, you thought it was going to be Christopher Daniels' swan song, but who knows now. I love the Billy Ray interruption at the end of the match. And the reason I say who knows if it's Christopher Daniels' final match in Ring of Honor is that he took the kendo shot for the owner of Ring of Honor or representative of Ring of Honor um, during the Bully Ray match. The Bully Ray Flip Gordon match, that was my match of the night. I just loved it. It was, it was almost like an old school ECW type match. It was so fun. Like it was like you had all this technical wrestling and all this other stuff going on beforehand. And it was like, you know what? All right, we've had all that. Let's have some fun now. Right. And you know what? It could have been a cluster at the end, but it wasn't. Right. It it it, it was on the verge of looking extremely overbooked, but it worked. <laughs> I, like I said, it was it was like an old school ECW match, e including the Sandman showing up. Which, who expected that <laughs> at, a, at a Ring of Honor show, especially a final battle? Um, I had to leave before the latter war started, but I've heard good things about it. The Jack Sabre Jr. and Jonathan Gresham match, that was an awesome match. J uh, Zack Sabre Jr. is one of the smartest people over there in the UK by not signing that NXT contract that he was offered. So he's able to go and do whatever he damn well pleases. Um, the Matt Taven versus Dalton Castle match, I also thought that that was awesome. Hearing rumblings that the WWE is interested in Dalton Castle, I don't think he should go there. Um, I don't think that the WWE would necessarily know what to do with him. I think that he's everything that someone like Fandango, Fandango or um, or his tag team partner um, could, could have been in WWE. Um, especially with him having the boys and everything like that, that WWE wouldn't know what to do with a Dalton Castle. So I think that he's just fine in Ring of Honor. 
the Jay Lethal Cody Rhodes match, I was very underwhelmed by. Um, like I said, I'm not a big Ring of Honor watcher, so I don't know uh, if the spot where Jay Lethal does those suicide dives is something that normally happens in this match. But every time he did that dive, it became less and less impressive <laughs> to me. <laughs> and so that really, it it was. It really took the the wind out of the sails for me in that match. So I was very underwhelmed by that match. Um, like I said, we know Cody and the Young Bucks are leaving. I don't see Ring of Honor necessarily sweating their departure when they do leave Ring of Honor. I don't know how many extra eyeballs that they brought to the product or how many extra or how many eyeballs that Ring of Honor will lose by them going. But from the looks of the talent that were on final battle, I think the Ring of Honor is still going to maintain its position and the future looks very bright for that organization going forward. I would have to second that. Yeah. I've, I've said before, I think Ring of Honor has potential to be the number two promotion if they had the money to back them. Right. Yeah, like if if they had like whatever impact has going on behind them, I think they would be the number two spot. Right. Yeah. So now we move on to what happened Sunday following final battle, which was WWE's TLC 2018 pay per view. And to kick things off on that, I'm gonna throw it to Chris Black so he can give his thoughts on TLC 2018. Oh, man. The only thing I could think of was overall TLC for me was very, very disappointing because not to say I'm selfish, but it kind of everything that I thought was going to happen just didn't. And I'm kind of it just left me kind of confused as to what direction they're going to go in. And yeah, we can talk about Monday night, but yeah, I'm not. It's it just sour taste in my mouth. TLC left a very sour taste in my mouth, except for except for the triple threat, Becky Lynch, Charlotte Flair, Asuka. That was the only saving grace, honestly, of the entire pay-per-view. See, I, I looked at that pay-per-view totally different than you did. I To me, I thought the only match that I was just like kind of whatever about was the... Um, Oh god, which one was I just had it in my head? Um I thought all the matches were pretty decent. I didn't think there was a bad match on the card with the exception. Oh, the Braun Strowman uh, match. Just because I thought it took too long. I get where they were going with it, but it just took too long. And I thought Darren Corbin was kind of like no selling when he was taking, you know, all those moves or whatever. Uh, but I I thought everything else was good. I liked it. I mean, again, I think there were some matches that should have went down differently like i really think the tag team match should have been a uh should have been a tlc match instead of the braun Strowman deal especially with braun Strowman them not really having a tlc match they should have just gave it to the tag teams but that's this is my opinion but i thought it was great and i did think match of the night was a triple threat with the women uh but i also thought the raw women's championship match was great as well I would have to say second, well, third, I guess the opinion that the triple threat women's match was the match of the night. Um, to me, um, TLC was a bloated pay-per-view. There were like 12 or 13 matches on there. So we knew going in there were, there were going to be a lot of um, short matches and everything. Um, the longest match of the night may have been the women's match. I don't have times in front of me. It was either that or the Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose match which was probably the most disappointing match of the entire night because what should have been a brawl was a technical display of wrestling, which made absolutely no sense in the midst of the storyline that the WWE was trying to tell to everyone. Um, the bar, the new day and the Usos that match went much quicker than it should have. And like we've all said and reiterated, it should have been a TLC match. The Braun Strowman and Baron Corbin deal it 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 was what it was. Everyone pretty much with a brain knew Braun Strowman was going to show up and that he w wasn't going to be necessarily able to compete. So I wasn't upset with what they did there. But I was upset with what, how they did bring it back the next night on Raw. So we can just go right into Raw. TLC, for me, gets a C-minus grade. Out of the 12 matches or 13 matches on the card, only three of them delivered, in my opinion. 
Um, well, I, I will agree. With, I will agree with you. The, the, uh, the um, match with Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins. I did forget about that one. That one was pretty bad. Um, but again, overall, even with that one being bad and the other match I named being bad, I thought all the other matches was pretty decent. So I, I wouldn't give it a C. I'll give it a B minus. I think you just looking on the bright side of the things. Like, yeah, I'm, let me just add with the Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose match. Um, Steve Stone, who, you know, we spoke to in episode two about the booker for um, MSPW. Uh, promotion down in MSPW. He he put on Facebook, Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins just locked up. I'm done. And if you don't understand <laughs> that, you don't understand wrestling. Right. I agree. And it went too long. It was like 45 minutes. No, it wasn't that long. But it, it, it went long. 24 minutes. I do have the official time on that. I believe it was 20. It was 23 or 24 minutes of wrestling. But guys, we're, but guys, we're forgetting about an important thing that happened at that show. We now know who is going to be number 30 for the men's and the women's battle royal. Oh, yeah. So we're going to have a great little dance break. <laughs> <laughs> um, which, like I said, we can move on to Raw from the TLC pay per view. It was being made made known all night during the pay per view that Vince McMahon was going to be showing up on the next night on Monday Night Raw to shake things up on the WWE. We've discussed on this podcast how the ratings have been falling for WWE, and then they've been losing about two hundred thousand subscribers. Was pretty much the average every week. They had just gotten their lowest rating in the history of Raw in the 25 years of Raw, pretty much 26 years now. Um, so what came of that? Well, Vince McMahon comes out on Monday Night Raw, says that things haven't been going the way that they need to be going, and that the WWE plans to move forward by shaking things up, bringing in new talent. Well, he wasn't the one who made that announcement. He just said that they hadn't been delivering on their entertainment aspect and brought out Stephanie McMahon, Triple H McMahon, and Shane McMahon. And Triple H said that we are now the authority. They're going to start. They haven't been listening to us or giving us what they want, so giving us what we want, and that they're going to do better. So how do they deliver on that promise? By... <laughs> doing the segment from TLC with Baron Corbin getting beat down by pretty much the entire roster that he had wronged on uh, Monday Night Raw. He was put in a match with Kurt Angle. Then Triple H comes out and changes it to a no disqualification match. And then he changes it to a handicap match and Baron Corbin um, loses and is still out as Raw general manager. Um, what else do we get on this show? Uh, we had a promise of New superstars. I don't have those six superstars in front of me. If one of you guys can pull that up so that we can mention who is going to be moving up to Raw and SmackDown in the next several weeks, is which is the timeline that we were given. We do know Lars Sullivan is going to be coming up. But like I said, if you guys could pull that up for me. Um, the, the show was still pretty much the status quo. The only unique thing that happened on Raw that really wasn't anything that we hadn't seen before was the fact that um, they had an open challenge for the Intercontinental title by Dean Ambrose. And, ah, why am I blanking on his name right now? What is Fandango's tag team partner name? Uh, Tyler Breeze. Yeah, Tyler Breeze faced uh, Dean Ambrose for the Intercontinental Championship, which... <laughs> we all knew it was going to happen there but it was nice to see Tyler Breeze back on Monday Night Raw we know he had went down to NXT possibly for some tuning up and seeing him on Raw he was he's not a new face but it was a face that you hadn't seen in a while but that was pretty much the only new thing that we got on that show on Monday the one thing that I can say is that that crowd there in California gave WWE all of the energy that they possibly could that night um, I thought that they had a great crowd. I still don't think that Raw delivered on the promise moving forward. Um, I am interested to see how Raw for next Monday is going to go because they did pre-record next Monday night's Raw, which means that that crowd there was there for a six-hour paper, a six-hour show, pretty much essentially, 
it could have been even longer because they did three hours of raw live and three hours of raw that was pre-recorded and right now um i'm gonna let my co-host give you their thoughts on monday night raw and then we will touch on next week's raw so, I, feel, I feel like raw was was the same stuff different day um <laughs> they shook nothing up everything's still settled at the bottom uh, it's the same thing. I mean, you're going to get the ratings because Vince McMahon is going to be there as always because Vince McMahon is the man. He brings the ratings. But uh, overall, I don't think they delivered on their promise, but it's still early. So we'll see what happens. And there you go, trying to be positive again. I'm, you know what? I'm just thinking too little, too late. I mean, the McMahons want to come out and basically say to people, I know, I know we've sucked lately, but, you know, trust us, we're going to do better. I, I don't believe them. Show me. I'm getting tired of listening to WWE and McMahons and Triple H, them coming out talking about, oh, we're going to shake things up. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to make things different. No, no. What's the point of bringing up new talent if you're just going to crap all over them when they get up there? We need better booking. We need better storylines. We need better writing. Okay, you just need to have this pep talk that you had in front of the fans to your writers, to those people in charge, because that's where the, the change is going to be made is back there. The talent, they know what they're doing. They're going to do what they do and do good things out in the ring. That's not the problem. The problem is the production, the writing, the booking. The problem does not lie in the talent. I have a question the for problem you. problem uh, lies in with the, the office. One of the most interesting segments on Monday Night Raw was Seth Rollins basically admitting that he had a bad match, that he heard the crowd out there and the chants and everything, and that he apologizes for it and that he needs to do better moving forward. Do you think that Seth Rollins should be taking that blame? Do you think the match was booked in that way? Or do you think that's the match that Dean and, and Seth worked out for themselves to go out there and do? That has to be what they worked out. That has to be what they worked out for themselves. I don't think so. I think that they they they're like most superstars. What well, from what I've been hearing, is like walking on eggshells back there. They do what they're told. You can't tell me that Dean Ambrose and Seth didn't say, "Why the hell are we locking up? We're ready to kill each other." Like, why would you? Why would you even agree to that? But do we know if they did that? Because I mean, maybe, maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But I mean, to me, I, as a as a superstar, if I know if a booker tells me something that doesn't make any sense, I'm gonna try to convince that booker if I can that this doesn't make any sense. Right. And even if that doesn't work, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do what they tell me to do, but I'm going to do it in a way that makes sense. So, for instance, if they told us they want us to start the match locking up, okay, maybe we lock up, but okay, that lock up is going to be very brief, and then we're going to be fighting after afterwards. That is so, going to be an extremely kinda, aggressive lock up. Exactly, like it has, it had. You, you just have Put to make it make sense. It. Put some stank exactly, on it. right? Like roll, go to the outside with it. You know, get get crazy with it. I just, the, I don't know. Like again, like Steve Stone said. I know that if I'm having a blood feud with someone, the last thing I want to do is shake their hands before I fight them. It was pretty much the opposite of everything that we saw in the um, Gargano, <laughs> in the Gargano feud. <laughs> it's like, yeah. what are we, I would have been like, what have we been doing the past two months? Right. <laughs> so, I mean, to answer your question, I think Seb did not have to apologize because it wasn't his fault. Well, I, well, again, I guess we can't say that because we don't know what happened in the back, but we know what we saw in the front. I would say, like, it, it's been it's been kind of funny just watching the WWE because they, they for the past two or three weeks, they've just apologized for everything. <laughs> They're just apologizing for everything. And the funniest thing is that I, I listened to um, the Don Tony and Kevin Castle show, which is another podcast. You guys can check them out if you feel like it. Um, but Don Tony does a This Week in Wrestling History segment on his show every week. And it is one year, I mean, not one year, but it is, um, I believe it was 1996 or 1995. Pretty much th this exact week that this announcement was made years ago about like 20 years ago 
Vince McMahon was on television. This is when he did the infamous promo that we think you, the audience, are tired of having your intelligence intelligence cha uh, challenge, and uh, we're going to be embarking on a much more extreme form of entertainment that 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 we don't recommend for children to be watching, which was almost the same statement that they made on this Monday Night Raw um, with the McMahons coming out. The difference being is that on that episode of Monday Night Raw, when that announcement was made, that was when you had Stone Cold throwing the Intercontinental Championship into the into the ocean, <laughs> and, and you had extreme things happening. It was an extreme change from everything else that had been going on at that time with the animated characters and everything like that. They pretty much went head first into something new. Now it is 2018. People are way more sensitive. I'm not even going to say that people are more sensitive. I'm going to say that the so social media gives the minority the largest voices, which makes it seem like they are the majority out here. And so I don't think WWE is going to go that extreme. The most interesting statement made on Monday Night Raw was when they said that they haven't been listening to the fans and they haven't been entertaining us or giving us what we want and that we're, we're the authority now. So what I see WWE doing is really empowering the WWE universe <laughs> and giving us what we want. And then when we get bored with it and it and nothing is changing, they come out and say, look, we tried it your way and look, you guys still aren't happy. So it, the problem isn't us. The problem is you. Someone's going to get heat like that. I see that happening. I, I think that the W is going to give the people exactly what they want. And then the people are going to be like, no, but you know what? This isn't what we actually want. Because all this time, Vince McMahon, who is the person that runs everything, everything goes through Vince, which is what we hear has always believed that he knows what the fans really want. I totally believe, I believe it has to be a balance of the two. You have to give people what they want and take it away from them. Like, you know, you know it's like if you get a kid, you got a candy bar. And you give your kid a candy bar, you like put it in their face and they reach for it, you take it away. And the kid's going to cry for a little bit and you put it back in his face again, they stop crying and you take it away. And then eventually you give them, you give them the candy bar. Like, it, it should always be that because if you give the kid the candy bar right away, kids are not going to be grateful for it. But if you tease them with it and tease it with them, they're like, okay, I really want this. Give this to me now. And then finally, after, you know, working for it for a little bit, you finally get it. Then you feel like it has value. Right. I, I see that. Uh, did, did anybody pull up the names that are coming up from NXT? I got them. Um, um, yeah, can, can you read those names really quick? I got Lars Sullivan, EC3, Nikki Cross, Nikki, Nikki Cross, Cross, Lacey Evans, and that's it. Yeah, Heavy Machinery gets two. Heavy right. Machinery. Yeah. yeah. Lacey Evans. Okay, I I can see Lacey Evans getting good heat on the main roster. Nikki Cross looks completely different from every other woman who is on the main roster. So they need to do something with her. Um, th there's really like the one thing about Lacey Evans coming up is that she's another big blue blonde chick. <laughs> they got a bunch of big blue blonde chicks. I see. I think Dana Brooke is going to be getting her pink slip really soon because they're not doing anything with her with the bringing up Lacey Evans. Um, and like I said, Nikki Cross has a different look from everybody else. EC3 is someone who can prosper on the main roster, but I think that they that they're gonna have to give him a mouthpiece. Not that he's a bad promo. I just think that his character. He, I think when he comes to the main roster, he's gonna essentially be the JBL, the um, Alberto Del Rio with his gimmick being the one percent. Um, I like EC3 when he was in TNA. I haven't cared for his his. Uh stuff in WWE with the exception of when he was in the uh, ladder match for the UK title. Yeah. I don't I don't I don't see EC three translating well on the main roster. I like it like Mustafa said, I liked him in TNA. I like the character. I don't know how well that character is gonna fit in because basically in TNA EC three was just kinda like a bootleg McMahon 
to be honest. Uh, right, as, but as as long as they don't try to make him a face like Bobby Hill, I mean, Bobby uh, Bobby Rude. Why well, I say Bobby? <laughs> oh damn it, Bobby! <laughs> Propane. <laughs> propane accessories but um no as long as they don't try to make him a face like they did with bobby Roode, i think ec3 is someone that could that could prosper on the main roster and i think it would even be been even better if he came to the main roster and he came to raw and bobby Roode was a heel and him and bobby Roode hook up and become the millionaires club or something like that i don't know what, what you would call them but i think that, that could have been a a great little tag team on the on um, the main roster um, heavy machinery coming up. I feel like they're going to be another bar. They're going to be, I mean, not, not another bar, but, um, the, the club or the, they're going to be the comic. They're going to be comic relief. I, I like the stakes and weights, um, gimmick of them. And they're like men's man and everything like that. But just look at what they did with AOP and how they came up. Now they've become comic relief. They're AOP. There's no rehabbing AOP. There, there's no rehab like their manager lost them the tag team titles and they shrugged it off there's no reason that he shouldn't have got his ass kicked for costing them the titles on the same episode that he lost them the titles not a week later not a payoff that's gonna come maybe next week or the week after that it should have happened when they lost those tag titles especially um and 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 if you weren't gonna give us the payoff of him getting beat down it should have happened when they confronted Shane McMahon backstage on Raw and said, hey, we lost our tag titles and it was unfair how we lost those tag titles and we deserve a rematch. And Shane McMahon says, oh, I think that a rematch clause is very antiquated. So you're not going to get a rematch clause, which is also funny because WWE did just announce the the uh, women's title match for SmackDown on, um, one of, on main event and it's going to be Becky Lynch versus Asuka. So... We got that match to look forward to at Royal Rumble right now. <laughs> so we know two matches for Royal Rumble so far. Hey, what's the other one? Um, what, what's the other match at Royal Rumble that we know? We know yeah. we know Brock versus Braun Strowman. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, one thing I'm, I'm going to add to that is I feel like every, every tag team is doomed right now in the WWE. Like, anybody that tries to get any type of quick start, it, it quickly gets extinguished and I don't, they don't, I don't they don't care for the tag division that's why they have more than enough teams to make the tag division something special but they won't do it because the writing sucks right but one thing that i i, I want to kind of leave it on this point with what this whole shake-up thing is going to be well i'm going to touch on it again once we touch on smackdown but they're going to bring up the six talents from nxt to the main roster and like Chris Black said, they're not even utilizing the talent that they have on their main roster to its fullest potential or not even to its fullest potential, just to its potential. <laughs> like, and, and you got people coming back to the roster from injury. You got Sami Zayn coming back. You got Kevin Owens going back. And then you're bringing seven, six people up from NXT. <laughs> You got five hours of television to fill each week on the main roster. You're not utilizing the people that are already there. You got people coming back from injury and you're adding to the roster. How are you going to come up with storylines for these people? There's only so many titles. There's only so much time. And there's only, I heard, and there's only I so heard, many stories to tell. I heard someone suggest that maybe every character should be assigned a writer. And maybe they can come up with storylines that way because if only one person focuses on character development for one wrestler at a time, I don't know. Do you guys think that that would improve writing? Because, like, you got to admit their character development, how they building stars or lack thereof, it's just not working. Well, well, let's let's look at let's look at something real quick though, because I don't think I, I I think they're trying to deflect like it's the whole company. But really, it's just raw because SmackDown writing has been, in my opinion, phenomenal compared to Raw. So I'm not sure if they're still using separate writing teams or if they're using one combined writing team. But I just kind of don't understand how we usually always get a consistent good product out of SmackDown, but we never get a good consistent good product out of Raw. 
I know the like, story. Why is that? I know the story. I hate to be a dead horse, but that... I know the story had always been that Vince doesn't necessarily show up to SmackDown tapings. He shows up to the Raws, but he is very hands off when it came to SmackDown. And I know that they said the past two weeks where Raw had his lowest ratings, Vince rewrote the entire script himself at the last minute. I don't really believe those stories. Not necessarily that he doesn't show up to SmackDown, but that he rewrote the entire script himself at the last minute. Uh, some of these stories that come out about Vince McMahon, I do believe that it's just Vince is like, if they don't like it, give me all the blame. I've always heard that he's not a person who really likes the praise and everything like that. And somebody like that, I could see him saying, hey, if they don't like it, it all it all falls on me. It's my company. So I think that they may have the same writing teams. It's just that on Raw, they are trying to write to Vince McMahon so that they're not getting vetoed. And on SmackDown, they can be more consistent. They can utilize their time better. You can even watch Raw sometimes and see how they stretch out segments. Like um, Monday segment with um, the women. I felt that like that was stretched out. That Naomi and Asuka match was trash. Asuka and Naomi have no chemistry. <laughs> well, like, you know, like, in my, in, my, in my real life job, okay, I manage multiple people. And let's say I have one person that does really, really great at a job and another person that doesn't do not so great. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give attention to the person that's doing great and figure out what are they doing that are making themselves great and then have that conversation and point that out to the person that's not doing so hot. Like, hey, because there, there should be a reason, there, there's a reason why these things are happening. It's not just happening for, like, no reason. It's not, it's never, I mean, luck does play a part in things, but, you know, you're going to have to put some effort in. And, 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 and something is lacking. I don't know what just happened. <laughs> it's like, I have gold here in NXT. I have gold here in SmackDown. What am I doing wrong here on Raw and not be able to fix the problem? Right. I I really don't know. I, I don't I don't think that every wrestler should have their own writer assigned to them. That becomes very expensive. But anybody that's into like literature and the arts and filmography and different things like that. They know that there's only a certain, there's only a, there is a finite number of stories that you can tell. And there's different paths that those stories can weave, but there are different story arcs. So WWE's writing team needs to have a board with these different story arcs with all these superstars names that they can put underneath these characters and put these characters into storylines that make sense for their character development. You have people coming up from NXT where they preach character development. You have people on the main roster who don't even know what their character is supposed to be. Or the fans don't know what their character is supposed to be because it's not fleshed out through story. So that's what the, the, the writers need to go back to the basics of storytelling in order to get superstars over to, and to get fans interested and to get fans entertained. But like I said, Spoilers for the following week of Raw, which is going to be this upcoming Monday, which is Christmas Eve. It's going to be more of the same. I believe WWE may be waiting for the new year to actually begin this shakeup, looking at what happens. So these are the results for this upcoming Raw. Spoilers in three, two, one. You got a Miracle on 34th Street street fight, which is Elias versus Bobby Roode. So that story is continuing. Bobby Lashley, man. Uh, Bobby Lashley, the match. you said Bobby Elias Rude. Elias beats Lashley. Yeah, <laughs> I said Bobby. Yeah, Rude. you said Bobby Roode. I did. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, when did that happen? <laughs> oh, I thought I said Bobby Lashley. Oh, well, I was like, oh, they did shake things up. <laughs> <laughs> you had Elias versus Bobby Lashley, and um, this started off at the, the, these results are brought to you by uprocks.com. Um, 
So this started off as Elias was trying to play a Christmas song in the ring and Lashley and Leo Rush interrupted. The match included a backdrop onto Legos and Elias breaking a violin over Lashley's back. After the match, Elias covered Rush in eggnog. Um, another match on next on this upcoming Raw is going to be Bobby Roode and Chad Gable, speaking of the devil. <laughs> and they defeated the Revival. Gable pinned Scott Dawson with a roll-up. This was for the Tag Team um, Championship, which on this past Monday's Raw, the Revival earned that opportunity. That was another way they shook things up by giving the Revival an actual chance instead of being buried by the Lucha House Party. <laughs> but they still lost. Yeah, and they still aren't tag team champions. Next up, we had Sasha Banks and Bailey and Ember Moon defeating Mickey James, Dana Brooke, and Alicia Fox. That is a shakeup. That's a match we've never seen before. We also had Finn Balor defeat Drew McIntyre and Dolph Ziggler. Finn Balor pinned Dolph to win the match. McIntyre declared himself for the Royal Rumble and got beaten up by Ziggler for trying to do a post match attack. I'm sure that that match is awesome. I do want to see that match, but again, not necessarily shaking things up. Um, next up, you had Paul Heyman cut, come out and cut a Christmas theme promo about how Brock Lesnar is going to destroy Braun Strowman at the Rumble. Strowman showed up. He scared Heyman. Then he put a Santa Claus hat on his head and said he would beat Lesnar. Again, that's something we haven't seen before. I guess Braun putting the Santa hat on is something we hadn't seen before. <laughs> yeah, I guess I have. I haven't seen that. <laughs> <laughs> then we had the Raw Women's Championship match, which was Ronda Rousey defeating Natalia. Uh, Ronda tapped Natalia out with the armbar, and that's a match we hadn't seen before. It had been teased before, but but to no one's delight. <laughs> <laughs> then you also had Heath Slater taking on Jinder Mahal. Um, Heath Slater won by disqualification when the same brothers got involved. Then Rhino showed up dressed as Santa Claus and hit a gore on Mahal. I just want to. I just want to see Rhino dressed up as Santa Claus. <laughs> Finally, you had Seth Rollins defeating Baron Corbin um, with a stomp. So that's your Monday Night Raw results for Christmas Eve. Now you don't gotta watch it. I I, I would suggest tuning into the Finn Balor, Dolph, and Drew match there's not a lot of matches well i guess for monday night raw that actually is a lot of matches so <laughs> you know are, are you guys sick of elias and bobby lashley because i am i was never I'm, interested in it from the beginning i know that i know xavier mustafa's a fan of the um of bobby lashley and his favorite pose so i know he doesn't get sick of watching they they just do too much. They do too much overkill. Like this is the reason why I used to stop. I had stopped watching Raw and SmackDown because I'm so sick and tired right now. Elias and Bobby Lashley. What is this? Their fifth time wrestling in six weeks. You know what? I will say I am tired of them two wrestling each other. But I think the pair of Leo Rush and Bobby Lashley has a limited potential because I mean Leo Rush is that annoying heel, and right. Bobby Lashley needs that. I mean, I no, I get that. Like Leo Rush is the you know the cartoon, the little dog that's always hopping around the big dog. Like that's Leo Rush and, and Bobby Lashley. Like I like their dynamic. What I'm tired of is Elias and Bobby Lashley, and the fact that WWE just overkills. They just beat everybody with the same exact matches every single week. Well, that's what I said. Why they draw things out? Like that their segments are some of the longest segments on Monday Night Raw. Besides Baron Corbin coming out five times, Bobby Bobby Lashley and Elias get some of the most TV time when it's not necessary. They always get about seven to ten minutes of television time just for the promo. <laughs> right. um, and these two, and these two could have had a very good program had they not been wrestling every single week. Or that the WWE had given us the payoff to Elias getting his hands on Leo Rush on Raw weeks ago, thanks to Finn Balor. Right. Um, right. Moving on to SmackDown, the only things I really want to mention from SmackDown are the facts that um, Mustafa Ali has been moved up from 205 Live to SmackDown Live um, permanently, and he pinned the WWE champion Daniel Bryan. 
That is very interesting. Now that was a shakeup. <laughs> See what happens when you try something new, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Again, SmackDown in the lead, doing things that Raw isn't. When you mix it up just a little bit, something may work. And I said this as a wrestling promoter. Sometimes you have to take those stabs at the dark. There's sometimes I'll make a card, and I'll be like, oh, that might be a stinker. And then it turns out to be one of the best matches on the card. It happened at the last show. Hmm. You know, we had somebody not show up. We had to come, we had to come up with a whole <laughs> different angle that actually is working. So One know, would say <laughs> that that guy who didn't show up made the show better. By not showing up, <laughs> you know what? Actually, they did. You're fired. But um, you're talking yourself out of a job, man. <laughs> oh no, I wasn't talking about myself. <laughs> <laughs> but um, another thing I want to bring up, and this kind of frustrated me on SmackDown. Like I like I already said, I mentioned it earlier. Vince McMahon came out to confront the women who were all in the ring. It was Oscar, Charlotte, and Becky Lynch. And they were all arguing about who, what happened at TLC with Ronda Rousey pushing, um, pushing Charlotte and Becky Lynch off of the ladder, and that Charlotte would have been champion if it hadn't have been for Ronda and Becky arguing she would have been champion if it hadn't been for Ronda and Vince McMahon coming out and basically chopping his two biggest stars down by saying that. He, especially Becky Lynch he said that she just makes excuses and feels like she's entitled which lets you know that those promos coming from Ronda Rousey about the Millennium Man were definitely coming from Vince McMahon um, I didn't like that at all especially because the women couldn't, couldn't even get a word back at Vince to keep their heat they just had to stand there and take it from, from Vince calling them being bickering and childish and entitled and everything like that when they actually had a point to a degree because they weren't the nothing that they did stopped Ronda Rousey from being able to compete or cost her 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 um, championship or anything like that especially Becky (laughs) So for the fact that Vince McMahon would come out and basically cut them down like that and not allow them to get any of their heat back, they had to watch Naomi and Asuka compete in a match that went much longer than it should have and just sit in chairs and watch the match. Also didn't like that um, how it's Charlotte and, and Becky were kind of attacking Asuka out there in the beginning of that promo because I don't know if the sound guy just had Oscar's mic down really low or whatever. It just seemed like th- they were just berating the hell out of Oscar, <laughs> mm. who who was a killer, and we know this. So I don't know. I don't know. Um, but again, Vince showed up on SmackDown. You hadn't seen that in who knows how long. And again, the same promises that were made on um, Monday night were carried over into SmackDown. Shane McMahon gave the entire backstage um backstage um gave the entire roster a speech backstage letting them know about the changes that were coming and that Paige is no longer going to be the general manager or whatever and she'll be taking over a different role which wasn't specified but again like i said the two highlights of raw were the fact that ronda i mean not ronda um Naomi was given a title match. Vince McMahon was on SmackDown and Mustafa Ali pinned Daniel Bryan. What did you guys think about SmackDown? I will, I will say, you know, just in... Uh, what I was going to say is, I will say, you know, that whole part with Vince McMahon kind of cutting down the women and the women just sitting there taking it. That's kind of real life. And it's Vince McMahon. So <laughs> I'm going to let that one slide because... If Vince McMahon was like my daddy or something, he can't walk up talk smack. I'm gonna sit there and I'm gonna take it too, you know, because it's Vince McMahon. Now, anybody else? Nah, I wouldn't play that. But <clears throat> I think it's it's really silly for Vince McMahon to come out and berate the wrestlers. I, I mean, our show sucks. It's because of you guys. No, actually, it's not, and we all know it's not. Well, I thought what, we were blaming only, it on Darren Corbin. Well, what the, happened to that? Well, the only reason I didn't like it is because the old Vince would have came out and said, "Ah, that fire." That's what I like to see. You guys want to rip each other's head off. But you're not going to get that opportunity tonight. You need to save that energy for Ronda Rousey because she's the one who cost your titles or whatever. He could have 
chopped them down and built them back up in the same segment. It was the fact that he just completely chopped them down. Like I said, the old Vince McMahon would have been all about them. Yeah, reach for that brass ring, rip, rip each other's heads off, save it for a Royal Rumble, I'm making a match, whatever the case may be. Not calling them entitled brats who were out there crying and bitching and moaning and complaining. That was what I didn't like about the promo. It was a change from the Mr. McMahon character. Maybe that really is Vince McMahon that we saw. It wasn't the Mr. McMahon character. But when I see him on television, he's Mr. McMahon, and he should have been telling them, yes, that's what I like to see. You guys are passionate, and I respect that. But tonight's not the night. Anything would have been better than what he did. Anything. Uh, anything at all. Just... <sighs> Again, I'm tired of the promises. I think that the the whole thing was done wrong. You can't blame the talent. We all know where the blame lies. Like, again, if you're going to address it, address it. If you're not going to address it, then just make the changes and don't talk about it. Just do it. I'm going to disagree. Baron Corbin was the greatest scapegoat. The other changes that the words, but they didn't kind of say, you know, oh, it was our fault. We didn't, you know, we didn't respect the fans, blah, blah, blah. No, I would have blamed it on Baron, Darren, Baron Corbin forever. Well, what I really like. Just because about, that's the storyline. One thing about Baron Corbin is that I don't care. I know that I like Baron Corbin. I'm not ashamed to admit it. I actually like Baron Corbin. And I know there's a lot of people out there who don't like Baron Corbin. And I know that there's a lot of people in the industry who don't like Baron Corbin. I know I spoke to some at the last Legacy Pro Show. But nobody can tell me that he didn't earn a little bit of respect for playing the role that was written for him on television. And then... They gave him a gimmick. Look, look, they look, gave look, him look, a gimmick on, wait, wait, and wait, he wait, ran wait, with it. Wait, and then taking all of the Vince McMahon lumps. Like, he was, like, getting jumped by the entire uh, crew or whatever... On, on the pay-per-view and on the following Monday, taking those chair shots and everything. He 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 played his role. He took his he played his role like a champion. Yeah, don't don't get me wrong. I'm not saying no no. I'm saying storyline wise. Not, right, right. No, no, no. I'm just I'm just I, I'm not saying that's what you're saying. I'm just I'm just putting that oh, out okay. there for people who still would be like, well, you know, he's the only guy in this position because he's a big guy. No. He went out there and he took he took those lumps. Whether whether those lumps for were for him, the, maybe the WWE not feeling like he was connecting with the fans or whatever, and and, it's, and it is your fault that we're losing fans because you weren't keeping them engaged because people call him boring Corbin. But like I said, just him taking those lumps like a man out there in that ring and taking those beatdowns and those chair shots, I, I like 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 you got everybody had to earn a little bit of respect for Baron Corbin from that. He didn't, he got interesting once he got the the commissioner position. That's when he became interesting, right? Once, like once. I mean, I know one of you guys said it on the podcast last time about like you know him being in this role and everything, and like that's his role. His role is to be the prick. The, his role is to be the guy that's throwing his weight around and abusing his power. And I will I will admit he did it. Phenomenally, because I hated the character, and then I think for them to shift the blame on the character, which they can do because again he was throwing his weight around, they can use that as an scapegoat. Why not use that as the scapegoat? Forget this whole. I mean, they don't have to forget the whole superstar shakeup, but to come out and say, "Hey, we had this guy abuse his power." You know, we're back in charge now, but still kind of keep the heat on Corbin because if you take it. I feel they took his heat away now because they're not, they're saying it's not Corbin. Now they're saying it's the people above Corbin. So now Corbin, not only did he do this character phenomenally, I'll give him credit because I hated it. Now you took his heat away because you made it, now you made it where it wasn't him. So now he took that, now he took that beating for no reason. I I disagree because when, like, they made that announcement and Baron Corbin came out right after that. And he got the booze that Roman Reigns got after he beat the Undertaker. <laughs> they wouldn't let him get a word in edgewise. But I want to move on. Yep. We already touched on Raw. Um, I want to give the SmackDown results for this upcoming week really quickly. Um, you got Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson defeating Sanity and the Usos. Um, the bar were at ringside. 
as were the New Day in Christmas costumes. Following that, you had R Truth and Carmella show up dressed as Santa and Mrs. Claus, which I'm going to tune in just to see Carmella dressed as Mrs. Claus. I'm a perv. Um, <laughs> Daniel Bryan interrupted that and cut a promo about how Santa and AJ Styles both aren't real, and then he beat down R Truth. Um, then Mustafa Ali defeated and- Andrade Cien Almas with the 054, which is also interesting. So you had him pin Daniel Bryan, and you also had to beat. Andrade I see in Almas, so I don't know. I can't wait to see that match. Yeah, that's gonna. If that wasn't on SmackDown, that could be a match of the year contender, I'm sure. Yeah, that's gonna be a good one, a really, really good <laughs> match. Then you have the Miz host a Christmas edition of Miz TV, where he once again begged Shane McMahon to be his tag partner, and Shane said that in a new era of WWE, they listen to the fans, and despite reportedly getting a mixed reaction, he agreed to be the Miz's tag team partner. And then the Miz did yes chance. What the hell are they doing with Miz and Shane? Like, I'm really weirdly, you know Shane, morbidly curious you know Shane has where to they're compete. going with them. You know Shane has to compete with the biggest name in the company every WrestleMania. <laughs> so, but I don't know. I'm not. It's not going to be as satisfying seeing the Miz potentially whoop Shane's ass. I mean, I know everyone enjoyed um, Undertaker kicking his ass and. Um, AJ. Uh, Kevin, I won't call him Kevin Steen. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Owens. Kevin Owens kicking his ass, but I mean, did anyone really want to see him? His match with AJ wasn't bad at all. Um, next up, you had Jeff Hardy defeating Samoa Joe, which Samoa Joe is just Garbage. for a check these days. <laughs> Garbage. Garbage. <laughs> Joe just can't catch a break. Hardy won by count out, and then he tried to put Joe through a table after the match. But got choked out. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> and then finally, I'm getting tired of them just crapping all over Joe. Yeah. Just... And then finally, you had the United States Championship match, which was Rusev defeating Shinsuke Nakamura and Rusev Pent Nakamura after a Moshka kick to become the new United States Champion. I don't know how I feel about that because. Too no, don't get me late. wrong. Too little, too late. Uh, yeah, too little, too late. Yes, because Rusev, I said before, why uh, on Twitter, I want Rusev to have another run with the U.S. championship. But it's bittersweet because I also like Shinsuke, and I really think they're not giving him his 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 due, his credit. Shinsuke should be way more important to SmackDown than he is. They need to utilize him properly. King of Strong Style has been neutered. I would definitely agree. He, um, If I was Shinsuke, I'd be leaving. But if the money is there, I guess, and he's older now, so he could just be there for a check as well. We know that WWE has all these all these uh, superstars over the age of 40 now. I don't know how old Shinsuke is, but I imagine he's somewhere between 37 and 40. So, but you know, if they if they let let's say Samoa Joe and Shinsuke go all out, just say, look, you guys go out there and put on one hell of a match. I believe that that match could blow anything out the water. Right. But <laughs> so you're just gonna agree to disagree? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I I agree. Like the, the, they don't take the they don't take the muzzles off of their superstars anymore. And we've discussed it before where they don't want, they only want the people getting over who they want to get over. And even those people, they're only going to allow to get over so much until they start tugging at that chain and dragging them back to the tree. They're killing the business. (laughs) They're going to kill the business doing it that way. I heard that they do it like sporadically. Like when they let Shinsuke and AJ have like, I think it was the last two matches in their feud. They let them go all out. Yeah, you gotta think. It's it's almost like those um those leashes that 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 extend out so the dog can go so far away from you, but then once it gets so far away from you, they get to the end of that, get to the end of the leash and get tugged, and then you can reel them back like a fish. <laughs> I think what they need to do is I think uh, legitimately I think Vince McMahon they need counseling. Because they need to talk about how CM Punk hurt them. They need to get that anger out. <laughs> It was years ago. They need to get over it. I mean, I understand, okay, they hurt them. Hogan hurt them. 
When you left Phil, went to WCW. Phil, Phil left them in their feelings. <laughs> right. Macho Man hurt them when he left when he went to WCW. I get it, Vince. So I get what you're saying Bret, Bret Hart, don't forget Brett. You know. So what Brett. you're so what you're saying is that Vince McMahon sits in the shower in the dark listening to Drake albums every day, thinking about CM Punk. <laughs> I think he does. I think he does. <laughs> but I mean, they, but they have to understand that, you know, you you can't keep everybody. But why would you do yourself a disservice by not letting your people get to the potential that they could get to? Because that's where you make money. Like, don't I, I would assume Mr. McMahon wants to make money, you know? But I don't know. Sometimes they act like they don't. So I'm sorry. This big man. This big man takes the approach of um, I'm trying to think of the Mongolian guy who says, it's not enough that I win. Everyone else must fail. Yeah, so Vince is not else. going to let people become bigger than WWE because he doesn't want them, like you said, going out and making someone else money. Everyone else must fail. Just winning isn't enough for him. But he should know, even those people losing. I mean, even though I'll probably say Hogan is the only really person that really made as much or maybe more leaving WWE, but none of the rest of them people. You mean to tell me Bruce, Brutus the Barber Beefcake went to WCW and made a whole ton of money? Well, I mean, you, think about it. You know? The Outsiders, when Nash, when uh, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall left, they kind of helped WCW like start dominating WWE in terms of ratings. So I can see how he can, but there's no number two company like that right now. That could compete with him. So mm-hmm. I don't know. Again, I don't know what he's so scared of. Scared money don't make money. But then he'll buy everybody, buy it, buy everybody else's talent because he's afraid they're gonna get big. Like I don't. He's trying it. to slowly smother them out. He thinks though, if he'll just hold on to their talent, eventually whatever momentum that they've been gaining is gonna go away, and they're just gonna slowly die off. And then he's free to do whatever he wants again. Well. Moving on from people who have hurt the WWE <laughs> to people who, who have you? inflicted pain on themselves. I don't know how many of you guys have seen this video of the guy attempting a 450 to the outside through a table who ended up cracking his skull on the ground. Um, the guy's name is Sean Phoenix. This, this actually happened back in October, but the video just now went viral of this happening. Um, but yeah, if you guys haven't seen the video, you can search it on YouTube. Um, it's not for the squeamish. But like I said, the guy attempted a top rope 450 splash to the outside of the ring and was supposed to go through a table and his opponent and completely missed the mark and went head first into the ground. The botch happened in a match with Dan Hooven against the culmination at IWC, the International Wrestling Cartel's Unbreakable event in Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. Um, Phoenix did provide an s- exclusive statement to Wrestling Inc. on the situation. He said, I suffered a life changing injury on October 6th. I didn't know if I was going to live or die, but I survived. And the first night in the hospital, my mind was thinking, How can I turn this into a positive? I am okay. I am very lucky to be okay. But I hope this video is a wake up call to other wrestlers. The risks are very, very real. If one wrestler uses this video to second guess the danger of a situation and we can prevent it, then this accident was worth it. My question is, have you guys seen the video? Yes. Yep. And what okay. were what were your thoughts on it? Ouch, right away. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I mean, at first it was ouch, but then it was like, Why? Yeah, yeah. And I get it. Yeah. When, after when he was sitting in the hospital bed thinking, was one of those thoughts, "What the fuck was I thinking? <laughs> Why did well, I think this was a good idea? Am I getting paid for this?" Well, he, apparently, he told one of the fans on social media that he didn't remember all of what happened. He did write I that, I didn't. Am, that I am an adrenaline junkie. Unfortunately, it didn't work out the way I wanted to. I only remember being on the top rope, then waking up on the floor. Imagine the worst headache you ever had. Then imagine getting hit in the head with a baseball bat with said headache every time someone spoke or looked at the lights. You know, I get it. There's times when, you know, the adrenaline is really going and you just like, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this, you know. But 
reality sometimes got to set in. You got to really like if you're going to go all out and do something like that, you need to be really careful. You got to really make sure you know what you're doing. Um, yeah, we've se- I, I've seen some crazy things in my years. Uh, mostly, most most of the times, whenever I'm really cringing is during like death matches. I'm always looking at death matches like, oh my god, like you know, I could never, I would never compete in that kind of a match because I don't see any point with my character doing it. Xavier Mustafa, should I tell him or should you tell him? <laughs> oh, see, wait a minute. <laughs> We'll so what's going on on New Year's Eve? We'll I have to get that call like, oh, what had happened? Chris was. Black versus T.C. Washington in a death match. <laughs> oh, see, I'll do that. <laughs> Didn't you say T.C. was the one who swung off on you with that chair? Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was Mustafa. But he the one who busted me up and gave me six stitches. <laughs> but, I'm uh, tell him what T.C. going to do to you. But, um, yeah, but, my question is, another question I have is, have you guys ever had someone have what's the worst injury you've seen someone suffer in person? And have you ever been involved in a match where someone wanted to do something crazy like that? And you were like, hell no, veto, veto, stop that shit. I've the way- a lot of the bad stuff that I've heard about, I haven't witnessed for myself. Um, I don't know. Let me think about that for a second. Mustafa, I don't know. You probably, I don't know. Have you seen anything yourself? I haven't seen a major injury myself, like in person. Um, at least, at least not that I can recall off the top of my head. But um, I've been in matches where people have called something, and I think it's absolutely ridiculous. And I just think about it like, okay, this person really wants to do this. What can I do as his opponent? to make sure that this person doesn't get injured. Because, I mean, yes, it's, it's your responsibility, too, to kind of protect them, even from themselves sometimes. Mm-hmm. So depending on the level of difficulty and my ability to be able to compensate if something were to go wrong quickly, all comes all comes into play. So, I mean, if I can, you know, quickly just change my position to be able to protect them, if I can catch them and slow them down before they do something or something to that effect. Yeah, I mean, like, I've seen people almost literally kill themselves. I've seen yeah. two guys who are rookies, they wanted to do a Spanish fly from the top rope. Now, people who don't know what a Spanish fly is, two people are standing on the top rope. Um, they're each facing They're positioned the like person. a rock bottom. They're positioned like they're going to do a rock yeah. bottom. Yep, and then one person does a backflip, the other person does a forward flip, and then you guys both pretty pretty much land in that position. Well, the one guy got up there, the second guy barely got up there. They were both shaking, and like I was literally praying that they both would not die. They did the move, but oh my God, was I about to crap my pants because I thought they were going to die. There's been plenty of times during matches, I, I think I've said before, and I think uh, one of our previous episodes where if there's something that I said in regards to chair shots, if I don't want to take a chair shot, I'm not going to do a chair shot. If there's something I'm discussing with someone and I'm not comfortable doing, I'm going to speak up and say, look, I'm not comfortable doing that. Um, I'm more concerned about hurting yourself because if I'm not comfortable with it, I don't want to risk hurting somebody else. So have you ever? Taken what I got to say for any young guys that are in the business, if you are not comfortable doing a move, speak up. Because you don't need to um, hesitate or do anything that may cause potential is- injury. Is there, it's just like how Taz lost his push was when um, he was fighting Kurt Angle and they saw him do that double clutch before he did the suplex on Kurt. And he was like, oh, no, we ain't pushing this guy. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever taken a pile driver? I have. Yeah, I've taken pile drivers. Nothing too dangerous. Yeah. Although I have taken the pile driver that Owen Hart and Stone Cold did that Stone Cold got injured. Yeah. I've taken those type of pile drivers doing the exact same move. And it's like, yeah, you put a lot of trust in guys because you know how it can go wrong. But again, that's 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 part of the brotherhood and that's part of trusting that the guy is trained that you're working with. All right. I remember my first Mondo Lucha show, which was the last Mondo Lucha show that I remember um, Xavier actually competing on. 
when he hit that moon salt and you hit the mark, but you didn't hit the mark. <laughs> uh, how did that turn out? Was that guy hurt at all after that uh, moon salt? I actually got that on video. <laughs> Which one was that? Um, uh, it was the Mondo Lucha two years ago. It was in a tag team match with you and Cruz against um. Uh, I forgot the tag team names. It, it was the like the Vault Villain group. And you hit the moonsault and you pretty much caught um, him knee first in the stomach. <laughs> oh, I remember seeing that. Yeah. <laughs> well, see, I mean, even then, I protected them, I protected them a lot by, you know, when I realized that I wasn't directly under them as I was coming down, what I did was I used, like, my upper part of my body to kind of brace it a little bit so it wasn't my full force of my legs coming down on them. And then he protected himself as well, so everybody was fine. Yeah, that was a holy shit moment. <laughs> I was like, "Oh, he, he dead." And when he got back up, I was like, "That's a shot." But uh, but I mean, the, the worst I've seen, and it wasn't really that bad because the guy didn't get busted open or anything. But in a match with me and involving me and TC, we a guy was gonna do a, a top splash to the outside onto me and TC. Oh, you remember, remember that, that, Mustafa? Yes. And he motioned for us to back up, like he's going to jump further, so he wanted us to back up. We backed up, he jumped, but he shorted, and his face bounced off the ground. <laughs> now, I want to add a little bit to that. What immediately happened after that <laughs> is Chris Black and T.C. Washington both looked, and then Chris Black, as the heel that he is, commits to putting boots to this kid and <laughs> said, that's what you get. <laughs> hey, you had to roll with it. <laughs> so at this point, Scotty Too Hotty is in the ring trying to signal for his worm, but nobody is paying attention because they just see this dude just go splat on the ground. So Scotty Too Hotty, you know, he does the thing where he puts his hands to the left and waves them and then to the right. So he's like doing that like over and over and over again, trying to get crowd <laughs> to pay attention to him. But yeah. It was great. I mean, other than that, you see little things where, you know, mostly when guys are, you know, doing dives to the outside, not everyone catches you, and those are always scary. And you know what? People want to give me crap when I was first breaking into business. They're like, hey, you should do more high-flying moves. And I always had the attitude, that's a good way to break your neck. And since I've always been into, like, Bret Hart, you know, guys that didn't really need to do a lot of that high flying stuff, but when he did do that kind of stuff, it was very rare, but it meant something. So I'm you're not gonna catch me jumping and flipping and flopping all over the place. No. Yeah, you gotta break it out like Undertaker. <laughs> I mean, when I wrestled down in the South, when I lived down there in Tennessee and I was doing shows down there, I would do dives periodically, but it would always be with people that I trust to get those. They didn't necessarily have to catch me, but they had to catch me just enough to slow me down. Right. That's all I required because, you know, I'm not really trying to land on something. I mean, I'm a big dude. And that, that's that's not going to end well. Right. <laughs> so moving on from all of that, let's get to the last segment of our show. If you're a regular subscriber or listener, you know that this is when we start touching on movies. So we'll do a hot round because I know what I've seen and I know what you guys haven't seen. <laughs> I've been out here putting in that work. <laughs> I think Chris Black gonna have to man. Can I can I get the death on my movie schedule? Can that's I, all. Can I get the death match with Chris Black? <laughs> 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 but um, well, so Spider Man into the Spider Verse. Who's seen it? Not I. <laughs> I've seen You're the only one that's seen that. True. Spider-Man to the Spider-Verse. I will tell you guys right now, it is my movie of the year. So if you have not seen it or if you are intent on seeing it or not intent on seeing it, I say see it in the theater. That is a must make sure this. That is a must see was it, in the theater. Was it better than Ready Player One? It was Ready Than Player One. Um, really? really? And if you don't cry in that movie, something is wrong with you. <laughs> Um, well, I can't wait to see it. Unfortunately, life has gotten in the way, so I haven't seen it. But I, I did have her. I've heard good things. So I'm and there are two. So I'll probably have to in, check it out tomorrow. And there are two end credit scenes. I will throw that out there too. So stay all the way until the, all the credits have run. And yeah, 
that that is my movie of the year over Ready Player One. Ready Player One is number two now. Wow! Um, I really got to go see this. Yeah, yeah, it, it is a must see in theaters, in my opinion. Um, Creed Two, who's seen it? Not I. <laughs> Not I. <laughs> Creed Two is good. Um. It's probably my number nine movie of the year that I've seen. Remember, I only go off things that I have seen. So it would probably be like my number nine or my number eight. Uh, what else is out? Aquaman. Who's seen it? I have. I've seen the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, since we got one that the majority of us have seen <laughs> we can discuss but i don't it. mind being spoiled because dc sucks ass no i can just we can discuss it without actually giving spoilers the only thing i'm gonna say about aquaman is that it is a good movie it's not a great movie but it is exhilarating and it is definitely a movie that i would also recommend seeing in theaters unless you have like a 60 inch or plus 4k television when it comes out because the CG in this movie is some of the best CG of the year, in my opinion. B besides Ready Player One, but that entire movie is CG. So, Aquaman gets the visuals for the year for me. Like, it, it, it's almost, it, if I had seen it in 3D, it may have been almost on the level of Avatar. So, they created a beautiful world. All right, so I'm going to completely disagree with you on that. I thought the movie was great. Um, and I'm going to go on record to say that DC hands down make good solo movies. Anytime they do any type of team-ups, it's trash. Utterly, utter trash. Um, I said that was uh, Wonder Woman. Uh, Wonder Woman was great. Uh, people want to give Man of Steel crap. Man of Steel was great. Um, I don't know about great. You know, but the, I'm, 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 I'm by my tongue now. All right. <laughs> and I I thought this movie was great. I thought they. I think you think it was great didn't... just because you had low expectations for anything in <laughs> DC. And I think that that raised things up. I didn't have. Well, no, because I, I always kind of had that feeling like they nailed the, the, the solo film. I think that they oh, no. nailed, I think they nailed, like, I can say this, is that Jason Momoa, out of anybody in Hollywood, I would love to meet Jason Momoa now. Like, I'm not a Game, Game of Thrones fan. That's another reason I think Eddie really enjoyed this movie, is that he is a huge Game <laughs> of Thrones fan. And so the fact that True. Jason Momoa is in the movie, basically playing Jason Momoa, from, <laughs> <laughs> like, that, that's pretty much what he's playing in the movie. So, like, watching this and not watching Game of Thrones, not knowing much about Jason Momoa, besides what I've seen on SNL, I'm like, they picked the perfect char character to play Aquaman. And the movie is great just based off the absurdity of the character Aquaman. Like, they don't really go back and rewrite the book to make you look at Aquaman as some serious, serious character. The one thing that I can say about the movie, and this isn't giving anything away as far as spoilers because they give it away in the trailer, is that once he becomes Aquaman in this movie, I feel like he actually earned his position way more than T'Challa did in Black Panther. Whoa, Arthur, whoa, Arthur, whoa, is, whoa, Arthur whoa. is much more of a king than T'Challa will ever be. Whoa. Uh-oh. I don't even know what part of this to address first is so much. Okay. So, first, first, let me continue my review of the movie. All right. First of all, he did it on I his own. thought they had, I thought they had a great villain in this movie. They did the whole thing where he could be a sympathetic villain, but he was a villain. Like, not like where Thanos, where you kind of side with Thanos a little bit. Like, this guy, you kind of have some stuff where you're like, you know what, I kind of agree with him on that. But no, you're an asshole. Like, everything he did was, was to be an asshole, which I thought made a phenomenal villain. All right. Now, when he had when he had the suit at the end, I will say I thought the suit was kind of terrible. It was too green for me. Like, if they made it a darker green or something, it just felt like it was out of touch with the rest of the movie. Like, the rest of the movie kind of had, like, these, like, 
dark undertones, and then you had this bright, cartoonish looking suit. It was only, bright, was and car- it was only bright and cartoonish in one scene when he first emerges with it. He was he was good after that. Uh, with the fight and everything, he was good. I thought the action scenes were great. I thought the CG was great. Um, now, we're going to compare him to T'Challa now. <laughs> Now, hold on. Aquaman didn't do half of what T'Challa had to do for him to be king. Yeah, his dad died, but then he had to go and he had to fight. Um, uh, what was dude name from the top of the mountain? And uh, yeah, he had he had to the fight Mbaku. Mbaku, yeah, he had to fight Mbaku. Then he had this cousin that he didn't know about that came. He had to <laughs> fight him too. Almost died. Dude just went down to Atlantis one time and was like, "Hey, half brother, you know what I'm saying? Why don't we be cool?" He, like, still, no, he still he yeah. still had. All right, T'Challa had three fights to become king, and Aquaman had two fights to become king. But at the end of the day, he did it on his own. <laughs> so did T'Challa. No, T'Challa so had help from T'Challa had help from his sister. I got. I have one question to ask. Did someone ask Aquaman? Did he go to all the Atlantis Atlanteans and say, "Is this your king?" He pretty much. If he did. didn't do that, then he don't beat Black Panther. He, he pretty much did. <laughs> he was getting his ass booed by the entire. He, everybody in Atlantis hated um, Arthur <laughs> when he showed up. But um, yeah, like I said, to me, it was a good movie, not a great movie. It is definitely a C in theaters. Um, they created a beautiful visual spectacle. Um, and it is it is exhilarating. It is definitely a popcorn flick. You just made me think about something else too. I don't know how much time we have, so I'm gonna talk briefly. What pissed me off about this movie though is that it made me even matter at um, Dawn of Justice because that scene they did underwater was trash. Well, and I knew it was trash when I seen it, just because the way it looked, I was like, "This looks dumb as hell." Well, I watched the video. The dude, I, I actually Aquaman, watched the, I actually they watched didn't it, matter. I actually that watched a video on that, and James Wan actually made it a point to change that in this film because it, anybody who knows the Aquaman lore is that they always spoke through um, air bubbles underwater, which would not translate well to a movie. So that's why mm-hmm. they did the underwater scene the way they did in Justice League, and in this movie, James Wan addressed that. And we got them speaking like regular people underwater. And that's how that ended up working out. But those are the latest releases that we've seen. Um, Going forward, I guess uh, Captain Marvel was what the next super big movie that we got coming out. I do still want to see Once Upon a Deadpool because I've heard that that's really good. Um, so I'm going to be checking that out whenever I get an opportunity. We got Bumblebee that came out this week too. Oh yeah, I I haven't watched any Transformers movie since the first one, so uh, I said, does I anyone really either, give a but... damn about Bumblebee? My kids want to see it, but I'm not really excited. I'm going to see it because it was Bumblebee. If it was like Transformers Six or something, I wouldn't I wouldn't care. Yeah, it's a prequel. But I so. think because they're giving time, they're giving time to the time to to Bumblebee. I think we should respect Bumblebee. I, I think the theme of this show is too little, too late, and I think the Bumblebee movie kind of falls into that category. Oh, you got to see it because of John Cena. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna assign my co-host a homework assignment really quick. Everyone has to watch the latest Marine movie, Marine Six, with Becky Lynch in it. Ugh. We're gonna discuss it on our January fifth show. Jesus but Christ! I haven't. Do I have to? Does that require me having to watch the the first five? They're not Marine bad. Movies? They're not bad. They are Why worth watching. Why does he hate us so much, Chris Black? They are worth I, watching. I don't know. But we got one minute, so we're gonna go ahead and sign out from you guys. Go ahead and give out your social medias real quick. All right. Well, I'll go first. You can reach me at Xavier Mustafa on Twitter. Or you can reach me at, at ebrownjr81 on Twitter. You can probably uh, reach me better on that one because I'm usually on that one more active than I am on the Xavier Mustafa one. But either one is fine. Well, you can catch me on Twitter at the underscore natural underscore CB and on Facebook at the natural Chris Black. And However, his page is still under construction. Yes. It, don't, don't mind my dust. Don't mind my dust. And... <laughs> okay. and Kiss my ass. <laughs> all right. And you guys can follow us and uh, like and subscribe to us on all the social medias. You can find us on Facebook, YouTube, um, Twitter. You can check us out at um, Slam. 
Saturday Night Slam Casters. Just search us on there and check us out on your favorite social, uh, on your favorite podcast app, Google, Stitcher, Spotify, all those different, um, all those different areas. Leave us a, leave us a uh, review and everything like that. We'll be coming back to you guys on January 5th. Be sure to come check out the Legacy Pro Show on um, December 31st, the New Year's Eve show. Like I said, we're going to be giving away two free tickets. If you win that bingo contest, Chris Black's going to be there. Xavier Mustafa's going to be there. And myself is going to be there um, DJing, making sure that you guys are entertained all night. So you've been listening to Saturday Night Slamcasters. Holla at your boys. We're out of here. Check us out. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year's. <laughs> Yeah, Merry Christmas, Happy Come New Year's. Slammed. Check us out January. Uh, check us out January fifth. Coming back at you guys. Peace. Come get slammed.